I always admired Bud Grant. And not only because he won 12 division titles in his 18 years with the Vikings. In 1969, I was the cameraman at this extraordinary shoot at his home. And I say extraordinary because these snowmobile lessons took place during the season. No coach today would do that, but when you think about it, maybe some of them should. Okay, come on, Pete, you sit here. You look at Mike Ditka, Dan Reeves, had heart attacks during the middle of the season and came back. Bill Parcells had to quit because he had a heart condition. Ray Rhodes was just recently quoted as saying, coaching is like having a loaded 38 pointed uh, at, your, at your forehead. Does coaching have to be like that? I don't think it's worth it, you know, to mm -hmm. do that. I don't think it's worth it to be like Bear Bryant, you know, retire mm -hmm. and walk off the field and die. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's not what coaching is about. I remember it was before one of your NFC championship games. And uh, I was supposed to do an interview with you on Saturday. It was Friday night, and I called you up at your house, and Pat answered the phone. And I said, this is Steve Sable. Uh, I know this is a bad time, but is Bud there? I'd like to talk to him. And Pat says, well, no, uh, Bud's busy. Uh, he had to go to the shopping center to pick up dog food, and then he had to come home and clean the kennel. Every other coach would be studying film or having meetings, and this was two days before an NFC championship game, and you were, you know, going to clean the dog counts. Well. You got dogs, you got a responsibility too, you know. Yeah. As I tell the coaches, you know, time does not represent work. If you got your job done and, you know, and, and it's 7 o'clock at night, go home. You just work long enough to get the job done because we don't have to sit around here and twiddle our thumbs. He'd go off and hunt after he'd finished practice at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He'd go hunting on Saturday before the game. And we didn't have four-hour practices. We didn't have marathon sessions. We didn't do all that. And, 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 you know, the other people who spent all their time studying X's and O's and starting them back and forth, it drove them crazy. Bud Grant didn't need a clock to remind him when to go home. And he didn't need a stopwatch to tell him who was ready to play. I never timed a player, you know, because... You never had somebody there with, that, with a four? Never, never timed a player. They just had to run fast enough. That was good enough. I could measure how, what the heart of that player was and whether when the things got really tough, whether he's going to have the heart to What were through. they? What were the things that he did? That oh, I'm going to put that in my book. <laughs> Bud liked tough players who thrived under cruel conditions, yet harsh words were never part of his vocabulary. One of my favorite coach was a guy by the name of Dave McMillan who coached the University of Minnesota basketball team when I was there for a couple of years. He, he had a Scotch accent. He's a mood. He said <laughs> two th one thing, he said, if you've got to discipline a player, he said, the first thing you do is tell them something good. Then they'll listen to you. He said, otherwise they won't listen to you. Second thing is, never do it in front of his teammates. Because he won't listen to you then either. So take them aside, find a time, find a place, find a situation, and then you can hit them with what's really wrong. We had a great player named Charlie West. And Charlie West caught a punt on the four-yard line, which is a no-no to catch a punt inside the 10. He goes 95 yards to win the game for us, and the place is going crazy. Charlie comes off the field, and I'm standing next to Bud. All of the noise factor, Bud says, Charlie. Charlie heard him. <laughs> comes over, he said, Charlie. If you ever do that again, you'll never play another down for the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> About that. <laughs> because and Bud was right. It was fundamentally wrong. He wasn't very close to the players. They didn't love him. Uh, but they understood that he had his values in order. And I think their recognition of this gave his players a lot of trust in who he was. This is a, is a quote which, which you say summarizes your feelings on leadership. A leader is best when people barely know he exists. Not so good when people obey and acclaim him. Worse when they despise him. But of a good leader who talks little when this work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. Because you know, most coaches quote, you know, from MacArthur or Eisenhower or General Patton. Where did this one come from? Did you? Who well, no, I don't. I don't have it. No, no. I, the uh, I mean, the, the who who uh, the Chinese uh, uh, Lao Tse. Yeah, Lao Tse. It was a, in what okay. year? Uh, Four ninety-seven, uh, something like BC. that. BC. BC. Yeah, I think that uh, what you're talking about there is teamwork. I could be just as happy without all the credit and let let the team revel in the victory, not necessarily me. 
Bud had his share of disappointments, whether it was because his coaching was too low-key or his opponents simply too strong. He lost in all four of his Super Bowl appearances. You said that you've never lost sleep over losing a Super Bowl. I do sleep, you know. I mean, I may anguish a little bit because you can't feel good about losing. But, you know, my life wouldn't be any different if we'd won four Super Bowls. I mean, I'd still be here, we'd still be doing this, and it wouldn't be any richer or anything like that, so. Now, wait a second, you'd probably be a little richer. Well. If you won, if you won two or three Super Bowls, there might be, a, you know, you might have your own cologne, or you might have oh, your own well, line of clothing or something, you know. Well, I, well whatever. That, uh -huh. that wasn't primarily interest anyway. Uh -huh. I have six children. They all graduated from college. I've got 11, going to be 12 grandchildren. When Danny, my last son, graduated from college, my obligations to my family from that standpoint financially were over. And I didn't have to coach any longer. Life does balance out. Grant never suffered the inconvenience of moving from team to team or the indignity of being fired. Only eight head coaches won more games. And when the time was right, he did reveal how much football meant to him. And if my mother was here today, she's 93 years old, she couldn't make it. I'd look at her face and see the pride she'd have that only a mother can have. A lot of people came away so moved by your speech. This seemed to catch everybody by surprise. Do you think that you've always been emotional and people just didn't know it? When you're taking pictures or, or whatever television does, I mean, you know, we're in a football game. I got a headset on and I'm, and I'm involved in a lot of things going on. I mean, I, I got no time for emotion. Here I had a lot of time for emotion, you know, a lot of time. My dad told me stories about the National Football League since I was that big. I mean, I was National Football League dinned into me all my life, you know, so when I ended up there, well, that was the culmination of a whole life. And if my father was here, he was different than I was. He was a very gregarious guy. He'd stand up and he'd say, the kid made it. He finally made it. See, there was a great ride. So everything really, really was, was good. I enjoyed every minute of coaching. And even though the ups and downs of coaching are always there, you can't look back and anguish over and say, what if? I mean, you just can't do that in this business. Otherwise, you get gray hair. <laughs> he always was, and still is, one of my favorites. Since my first visit with him back in the winter of 1969, yeah. an afternoon with Bud Grant has always been a reminder that you don't have to lose your mind or your health to become a master of the game.